The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. Let us begin by revisiting the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16 verses 19 to 31. Luke 16 verses 19 to 31. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And besides all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded though one rise from the dead. In this narrative, we encounter a stark contrast between a wealthy man living a life of luxury and a poor beggar named Lazarus, who endured tremendous suffering at the rich man's gate. Upon their deaths, Lazarus was carried by angels to be comforted in Abraham's bosom, while the rich man found himself in torment in Hades. We live in a generation that very rarely speaks on the topic of hell very rarely. There are even Christians who are held deniers, portraying hell as a symbolic place. However, this teaching categorically goes against the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. When speaking about hell, our Lord Jesus Christ did not use symbolic or metaphorical language. He spoke of a literal place, a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth, a place that is eternal. There is a hell. It is crucial to understand that hell was never intended to be the destiny of mankind. In the Bible, we learn that God created the Garden of Eden as a paradise for humanity to dwell in harmony and communion with Him. However, the fall of humanity through disobedience and sin altered the course of human history, introducing the possibility of eternal separation from God. Hell, as the place of punishment for the devil and his demons, was not designed with humanity in mind. In Matthew 25 verse 41, Jesus explicitly refers to it as the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. This verse makes it clear that hell was never intended to be a destination for human souls. Instead, God's desire has always been for humans to experience eternal life and fellowship with him in heaven. Yet, the choices made by individuals have consequences. The Bible warns that those who reject God's love and salvation, choosing to live in rebellion and unbelief, will face the judgment of sin, leading to eternal separation from God in hell. God, being just and righteous, honors our freedom to choose and allows the consequences of our choices to unfold accordingly. However, God's love and mercy offer a way of escape from this fate. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for the sins of humanity, offering forgiveness and redemption to all who believe in Him. Through faith in Jesus, we can receive the gift of eternal life and be reconciled with God. In Luke 16 verses 19 to 31 this rich man found himself in hell. I wonder what the rich man must have thought when he opened his eyes in the torment of hell. Did he think it was all a bad dream, a cruel trick of fate, or did he immediately realize the dreadful reality of his eternal abode? As the flames of Hades surrounded him and the darkness of that place consumed his soul, what was the first thing that crossed his mind? Did he remember his affluent lifestyle, the magnificent feasts he indulged in, and the luxurious garments he adorned while on earth? In that moment, did he comprehend the grave consequences of his choices and the weight of his actions? Perhaps the rich man's mind raced back to his earthly existence, and he recalled the sight of Lazarus, 
the beggar who lay suffering at his gate. Did he remember the pitiful figure of Lazarus, covered in sores, yearning for even the scraps that fell from his table? Did guilt and remorse flood his heart as he realized how he had callously ignored Lazarus' suffering, failing to extend a helping hand or a kind word? In the story of the rich man and Lazarus, we see a profound transformation in the rich man's perspective and priorities after his death. While he was on earth, he lived a self-centered life indulging in luxury and ignoring the suffering of Lazarus at his gate. However, in the afterlife, the rich man's focus shifted from himself to his loved ones still on earth. He became concerned about his brother's spiritual state and desperately wanted someone to come from the dead to warn them about the reality of hell. This dramatic change in the rich man's attitude is a sobering reminder of the eternal significance of our choices and actions. It illustrates that in the afterlife, our earthly pursuits and selfish concerns become inconsequential, and our attention turns to what truly matters, the souls of our loved ones and the state of their eternal destiny. I found myself in hell. The reason why will surprise you, the rich man might say, as he reflects on how his self-centered lifestyle led him astray. If the rich man were granted the opportunity to come back and preach one sermon, it is likely that he would share the harrowing experience of finding himself in hell and the reasons why he ended up there. He might emphasize the reality of the afterlife and the urgency of making the right choices while on earth. I found myself in hell. The reason why will surprise you, he would passionately declare, urging people to heed his warning and change their ways before it's too late. The title of the rich man's sermon, I found myself in hell. The reason why will surprise you would undoubtedly capture people's attention and provoke curiosity. It would highlight the unexpected nature of his fate, as many might assume that wealth and luxury would guarantee a favorable afterlife. However, the rich man's testimony would reveal that true wealth lies not in material possessions but in a life dedicated to loving God and caring for others. The story of the rich man and Lazarus serves as a poignant reminder of the eternal significance of our actions and choices. It calls us to examine our hearts and prioritize what truly matters in light of eternity. I found myself in hell. The reason why will surprise you, echoes in our minds, urging us to learn from the rich man's mistake and seek to live lives of compassion, love, and selflessness, reaching out to those in need and sharing the message of hope found in Christ. Yes, ultimately, the rich man did not go to hell because he was rich. He went to hell because he did not have faith in God. What we need to do is look at how he lived his life. He was self-centered, and he did not care for the poor and afflicted. God cares about how we treat others. In the torment of hell, the rich man may have longed for a second chance, a chance to change the course of his life, to be compassionate and charitable, to use his wealth and privilege to alleviate the pain of others. But alas, it was too late. The chasm between heaven and hell was fixed, and there was no going back. The parable of the rich man and Lazarus serves as a profound warning about the consequences of neglecting the needs of the less fortunate and living a self-centered life. It urges us to open our eyes and hearts to the suffering around us, to be compassionate and generous, to make a positive impact while we have the chance. May this powerful story prompt us to reflect on our own choices and actions, and to live with a deeper awareness of our responsibility towards our fellow human beings. Let it spur us to prioritize love and kindness, for it is in such acts that we find true significance and eternal rewards. This is something you need to understand about God. God cares about how you treat others. Kindness and compassion to others matters to God. As believers we not supposed to be cold-hearted and ruthless to the weak and vulnerable. Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in, or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick, or in prison, and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, 
Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty, or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me, and these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. To be a sheep of Christ means that your faith is evident in your actions and behavior. It goes beyond mere words and professions of faith. It is seen in the way you live your life and how you treat others especially the less fortunate. God places a strong emphasis on showing love and concern for those in need, as highlighted in Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46. This passage serves as a powerful reminder that true followers of Christ will demonstrate compassion and care for those who are suffering or marginalized in society. The sheep and goats narrative vividly illustrates the criteria for being recognized as a sheep of Christ. The righteous are praised for their practical acts of kindness and selflessness. They feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, welcome strangers, clothe the naked, and visit the sick and imprisoned. These actions reveal their genuine concern for the well-being of others, reflecting the heart of Christ in their lives. However, it is essential to understand that having compassion and care for the less fortunate is not a guarantee of salvation. Salvation is based on faith in Jesus Christ and surrendering to Him as Lord and Savior. There are people who may exhibit kindness and generosity towards others, yet they have not personally experienced the transformative power of Christ in their lives. Genuine salvation is a heart-level commitment to Christ marked by repentance and faith in him as the only way to God. Nonetheless, the presence of compassion and care for the less fortunate can serve as a strong indicator of a person's spiritual condition. It shows that the love of Christ is at work in their hearts, prompting them to reach out and help those in need. It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit's work within a believer, compelling them to follow Christ's example of love and service. Both Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46 and Luke 16 verses 19 to 31 emphasize the eternal significance of our actions, albeit in different contexts. These passages serve as powerful reminders that our choices and behavior towards others have eternal consequences. Together, these passages offer profound insights into the eternal ramifications of how we treat others. They remind us that our actions, attitudes, and choices towards our fellow human beings carry weight beyond this temporal life. Our treatment of others reflects our relationship with God and our understanding of His command to love our neighbors as ourselves. Indeed, the aspect of how we treat others is often overlooked in our understanding of God's character and expectations. Many tend to focus solely on personal piety, rituals, and religious practices, neglecting the profound truth that God cares deeply about our interactions with fellow human beings. Throughout the Bible, there is a consistent emphasis on loving our neighbors as ourselves and extending compassion to those in need. It is essential to recognize that God's love is not confined to mere words or feelings. It extends into practical acts of care and concern. When we love and serve others, we reflect God's love and character in tangible ways. Conversely, when we neglect or mistreat others, we distort the image of God within us and hinder the work of His grace in our lives. The Bible consistently urges us to consider the needs of others, to be generous, and to show mercy. Proverbs 19 verse 17 reminds us, Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. In James 2 verses 15 to 16, we are admonished not to turn away from the needs of those around us, but to take action to help them. God is watching you. Judgment is coming. How are you treating other people? Be kind. Be generous. Be loving. God is watching you. Those who exemplify compassion and kindness by meeting the needs of others find favor with God, receiving eternal rewards and inheriting the kingdom of heaven. Conversely, those who live selfishly and neglect the needs of others face eternal consequences, experiencing separation from God and eternal punishment. In conclusion, 
both Matthew 25 verses 31 to 46 and Luke 16 verses 19 to 31 underscore the eternal significance of our actions towards others. They emphasize that how we treat our fellow human beings has eternal consequences, impacting our destiny beyond this earthly life. These passages challenge us to live lives marked by love, compassion, and kindness, recognizing that our actions reflect our relationship with God and shape our eternal destiny. As followers of Christ, we are called to prioritize the needs of others and extend a helping hand to the less fortunate, understanding that in doing so, we are not only impacting lives in the present but also storing up treasures in heaven for eternity. Notice also in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers. It takes the grace of God to change us, folks. How can you be saved if you're not willing to repent? And the Lord Jesus Christ said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish.